How about one of you telling me what you're doing with your head buried in that four-speed gearbox? Oh, hello, Tech. I was just about to give Joe here a quick lesson on the four-speed manual transmission. Why don't you stick around and lend a hand? Suits me just fine, Bill. Uh, how do you propose to start this lesson? Unless you have a better idea, I thought I'd start with a review of the power flow in each gear range, then cover the shift linkage adjustments, and finish up with some of the latest service tips. That sounds good to me, Bill. You know, Joe, if you have a clear idea of which gears and parts are involved in each gear range, you'll do a better job of diagnosing shifting and operating problems. I have a general idea of how a manual transmission works, but I'm anxious to learn exactly what goes on inside this four-speed job. Okay, Joe. I'll do my best to explain what the gears in this box do. I think the best way to start is to identify the main parts of the transmission. To simplify things, let's break these gears down into three major groups or sub-assemblies. The main drive pinion is at the front end. Behind that is the main shaft assembly with its gears and synchronizers. Below this is the cluster or counter shaft gear. Now let's see what they do. In fourth gear, the drive pinion is coupled directly to the main shaft. Power comes in through the pinion and goes out through the main shaft without any change in speed or torque. That's why it's sometimes called direct drive. Now here's a most important fact to remember. In all ranges except fourth gear, there is no direct mechanical connection or coupling between the drive pinion and the main shaft. Here's why. The front end of the main shaft is piloted or supported in roller bearings at the rear end of the pinion gear. So the pinion and main shaft are free to turn independently except when they are coupled in fourth gear. In neutral, the gears on the main shaft are free to turn. In other words, they're not coupled or mechanically connected to the main shaft. The two synchronizer assemblies are always mechanically connected to the main shaft. That's because they are splined to the main shaft. However, the clutch sleeves can slide back and forth. The important thing to remember is that the synchronizer assemblies are always coupled to the main shaft. Now let's tackle the power flow. The drive pinion is always meshed with a cluster gear. So, any time the pinion is turning, it turns the cluster gear. And that means the gears on the main shaft turn too. But they don't transmit any power in neutral or fourth, right? Exactly, Joe. However, when you shift into low, the one-two clutch sleeve couples the first speed gear to the main shaft. The power flow is from pinion to cluster gear, from cluster gear to first speed gear, and then out through the main shaft. When you shift into second, you simply move the one-two clutch sleeve forward. The clutch sleeve couples the second speed gear to the main shaft. The power flow in second is from the pinion gear to the cluster gear, then from the cluster gear to the second speed gear and out through the main shaft. The three-four clutch sleeve does the coupling and uncoupling for third and fourth gears. The one-two clutch sleeve stays in neutral. As a matter of fact, uh, whenever one clutch sleeve is engaged or coupled, the other one has to be in neutral. Otherwise, you'd be in two speeds at the same time and tear up some gear teeth. Uh, but more about that after Bill finishes explaining power flow. In third, the three-four clutch sleeve couples the third speed gear to the main shaft. The power flow is pinion gear to cluster gear and third speed gear to main shaft. Of course, the one-two clutch sleeve stays in neutral. As we said earlier, in fourth, the front clutch simply couples the main shaft to the pinion gear, and the power flow is straight through the transmission. In other words, the cluster gear is turning, but it's just going along for the ride, without transmitting any power. Now how about explaining power flow in reverse? As you can see, the reverse idler is a spur gear, Joe. The only time it turns is when you shift in reverse. That's a feature of our transmission. The reverse idler is a sliding gear. It meshes with the spur gear teeth on the clutch sleeve and the spur gear teeth on the cluster gear. To shift into reverse, you slide the reverse idler into mesh with the teeth on the clutch sleeve and the teeth on the cluster gear. 
I can see what happens when the reverse idler is engaged. The engine's turning the pinion gear clockwise. That means the cluster gear is turning counterclockwise. Since the cluster gear is turning counterclockwise, it's driving the reverse idler clockwise. That means the main shaft has to be turning counterclockwise. So, the car backs up. You sound like your needle stuck, Joe. But I gotta admit, you got all your clocks and counters straight. Do you have any questions on power flow in this four-speed box? No, but I would like an explanation of how the synchronizers work. As you know, there are two synchronizer assemblies. Each assembly includes all the synchronizer parts. Since all the synchronizers work the same way, we'll only have to explain one of them to begin with. Let's get acquainted with the main parts of the synchronizer assembly. There's a stop ring, a clutch gear, shift plates, and the clutch gear sleeve. Let's see how they fit together. The splined clutch sleeve slides over the external splines of the clutch gear. When the sleeve and gear are fully assembled, you can just see the ends of the three shift plates. Next comes the stop ring. You'll notice there are three notches in the stop ring that match up with the ends of the three shift plates. These notches are wider than the shift plates. We'll explain why in a minute or two. First, let's see how this looks in a sectional drawing. Each shift plate has a ridge across its middle which fits into an internal groove machined into the clutch sleeve. This is a detent arrangement to hold the plates in position in the sleeve so they move back and forth with the clutch sleeve. Now let's put the whole synchronizer assembly on the main shaft. The clutch gear has internal splines which key it to the splines on the main shaft. A snap ring locks the clutch gear in place on the main shaft. Any questions, Joe? I've got several, Bill. But maybe if you'd explain exactly how the stop ring and those other parts synchronize a shift, that would answer all my questions. Okay, Joe. Here's what happens on a shift into fourth. In order to get into fourth, we have to slide the clutch sleeve over the teeth on the main drive pinion. Of course, the pinion gear and the clutch sleeve are turning at different speeds. When the driver starts to shift, the stop ring is pushed toward the cone-shaped shoulder of the drive pinion. The inner surface of the stop ring is cone-shaped, too. It works something like a cone-type clutch, I suppose. Key wreck, my boy. Of course, it's the ends of the shift plates pushing on the stop ring that actually move the stop ring into contact with the cone on the pinion gear. Uh, but I better let Bill tell you about that. As soon as the stop ring is pushed against the cone on the pinion, Friction tries to make the stop ring rotate at the same speed as the pinion. Actually, it does rotate until it's stopped by the shift plate. The shift plate positions the stop ring so that the ends of the internal teeth of the sleeve push directly against the stop ring teeth. The stop ring momentarily blocks the shift if there's quite a difference in speed between the pinion gear and the clutch sleeve. That's why it's called a stop ring. Of course, since the sleeve's pushing the stop ring against the cone of the pinion, friction soon makes the pinion start turning the same speed as the sleeve. When everything's turning the same speed, there isn't much torque load on the stop ring. So here's what happens. The chamfered ends of the sleeve teeth nudge the chamfered ends of the stop ring teeth sidewise, and the ring rotates slightly. This lines up the teeth so the sleeve can slip past the stop ring teeth to complete the shift. The sleeve slips over the teeth on the pinion. This couples the pinion to the main shaft. Any questions? Uh, just one. Who's gonna turn the record over? That gives me a good understanding of power flow and the synchronizers. Now how about explaining the fine points of the shift mechanism? Glad to, Joe. As you can see, the 3-4 and the 1-2 shifter shafts are part of the cover assembly. There's an interlock mechanism between the two shifter shafts. That interlock keeps the 3-4 shifter shaft from moving when the 1-2 shifter shaft's not in neutral and vice versa. In other words, you can't shift into two forward gears at the same time. Now here's a tip. Don't leave the detent ball pin out of the interlock when you build up a cover. If you do, the detents will work all right, but the interlock won't. 
I've seen fellas lose that pin and never even miss it. I'll watch that, Tech. Now maybe one of you can tell me what this cam-shaped extension on the reverse lever is for. I can see how the reverse lever moves the reverse idler gear, but that cam stumps me. That cam prevents an accidental shift into reverse when the transmission's already in first or second. It does a couple of other important things that Bill will tell you about. Let's suppose the transmission's already in first. The cam on the reverse shifter won't let you shift into reverse while you're in first because it would hit the one-two shifter cam. Likewise, when the transmission's in second, you can't shift into reverse because of interference between the reverse shifter and the one-two shifter. Now, let's look at another possibility. Suppose that when shifting into reverse, the teeth on the reverse idler gear butted head-on into the ends of the spur gear teeth on the clutch sleeve. This could bump the sleeve rearward, right into first at the same time you were shifting into reverse. Of course, you know what would happen if you let out the clutch when the transmission was in both reverse and first. Explain how that cam on the reverse shifter keeps that from happening, Bill. <laughs> okay, Tech. On a shift into reverse, that cam on the reverse shifter slides into contact with a cam-like surface on the one-two shifter before the reverse idler gear gets close enough to mesh with the teeth on the clutch sleeve. In other words, the close fit between the cam surfaces of the one-two and reverse shifters keeps the shift fork from moving. This, in turn, keeps the clutch sleeve from moving and being accidentally bumped into first gear. That close fit does something else important. Once you complete the shift in reverse, the fit between those two cam surfaces holds the one-two clutch sleeve exactly in neutral. That means the sleeve can't shift slightly, cause a stop ring to drag and wear out. You better tell Joe how to adjust the cover to get the cam surfaces just right. Assemble the cover. Its formal name is gear shift control housing, with the one-two and the three-four levers in neutral. Put the reverse lever in reverse. The attaching bolts should be just barely snug so the cover can be shifted by tapping it. Tap the cover downward toward the reverse lever to make sure the cam surfaces of the one, two, and the reverse shifters are contacting each other. This will give you a pretty good initial adjustment of the cover. To check the adjustment, remove the reverse detent plug so that the detent doesn't hold the reverse shifter in position. Don't accidentally unscrew the detent spring retainer, or the detent ball will drop into the transmission. Good advice, Tech. With detent plug removed, move the reverse shift lever an inch or so in each direction. You should feel a definite drag between the reverse and one-two levers. Finally, move the reverse lever into the neutral position. Then, Test reverse lever travel from neutral to reverse. You should feel a slight drag as the reverse and one-two shifter cam surfaces meet. However, the fit must not be so tight that the reverse shifter is blocked out of reverse. If it is, you'll have to reposition the cover slightly. Here's something to remember, Joe. The one-two shifters are a selective fit. If you ever replace a one-two shifter shaft, be sure and get the right one. Or if you install a new cover, you may have to put in a new one-two shifter. Here's why. Shifters are marked A, B, or C. The shaft to cam surface distance of a B shifter is greater than an A shifter. On a shifter marked C, the distance is still greater. I get the idea. If an A shifter's too loose, try a B shifter. Or maybe if a C shifter blocks the shift into reverse, it's too tight. And you should try a B or maybe an A shifter. That's the ticket, Joe. Now for shift linkage adjustments. It's impossible to overemphasize the importance of correct shift linkage adjustment. Everything in the linkage must be right on the button. Why is that? Remember, if one of those clutch sleeves moves more than about a sixteenth of an inch, it'll push a stop ring against the cone surface of a gear. If shift linkage is off very much, a stop ring will drag and wear out pretty fast. Another thing. It doesn't take much misadjustment of the shift rods to cause a rough crossover condition and poor shift quality. Bill will tell you how to go about adjusting the shift linkage to get easy shifting and good shift quality. 
I start with all three rods disconnected from levers at the transmission and put the three shift levers in neutral. Then, back off both the front and rear shift stop screws. You'll find out why we do that a bit later. Install this special tool to hold the three levers in the shift assembly in neutral. Be sure and use that tool. Don't try and line those levers up by eyeballing them. Good advice, Tech. Adjust each rod as carefully and accurately as possible. Turn the shift rod or swivel until the effective length is exactly right so you can slip it into the hole in the shift lever without moving the lever even slightly out of its neutral detent position. Remove the aligning tool and double check the accuracy of the adjustment by testing shift lever operation through all gear changes. Most important, move the lever through the gate several times to test for smooth crossover operation. There should be no roughness or bumping going from 3-4 to 1-2 and through the reverse gates or coming out of reverse into the 1-2 range. But how could the crossover be off if you use the tool? Here's why, Joe. You have to adjust each rod one full turn, but sometimes one half turn gives you correct rod length. In that case, you have to turn it another half so you can assemble it to its lever. If you guess wrong on that extra half turn, you may have to readjust to get rid of crossover bump. Here's a tip, Joe. Make sure the crossover between reverse and the 1-2 range is smooth going in both directions through the gate. If it isn't, I've found that a one-turn readjustment of the reverse rod will usually clean it up. I'll remember that, Bill. Now how about those stop screws we left loose? Don't adjust those stop screws until after you've adjusted the rods. Then with the shift lever in fourth, Turn the front stop screw in by hand until it just touches the lever. Back off one half turn and lock up the adjustment with a lock nut. Adjust the rear stop screw with shift lever in third. Turn the screw in until it touches and then back it off one half turn. What do those stop screws do? Those stop screws keep hot rodders and speed shifters from slamming the shift lever too far and bending the shift rods or maybe cracking the shift cover. Actually, those stop screws aren't too important on normal, sensible shifts. However, here's something that is very important. Make sure the stop screws are not turned in too far. If they are, they can prevent full transmission clutch sleeve engagement. Partial engagement causes jumping out of gear and can cause gear damage. Wow, I don't know where the time went, but we better wind this session up by telling Joe about some of the additional information in the reference book. Okay, Tech. An oil slinger must be used with early production pinion gears. Present production pinion gears have a wider boss and don't use a slinger. You'll find the details on this in the reference book. There's a new 1-2 shift fork that goes halfway around the clutch sleeve. If you have a shift problem that can't be cleared up by correct linkage adjustment, it's a good idea to try a new fork instead of dropping the transmission out of the car. Now, this isn't a nuts and bolts session, but you'll find some real practical service tips that'll help you do a better job of servicing this transmission. For instance, let me tell you about this homemade tool. Unless you happen to have three hands, compressing the center bearing snap ring with a pair of pliers while you try to separate the main shaft assembly from the extension housing is a mighty unhandy proposition. I formed the end of this piece of copper tubing into a rectangular shape so that it just fits over and holds the tangs of the center bearing snap ring together. You'll find out how to make and use that handy dandy snap ring tool if you read the reference book. As a matter of fact, the reference book for this session covers everything we've talked about today and a lot more besides. Be sure and read it and keep it handy. If you do that, you'll be prepared to handle the next four-on-the-floor service job that comes your way. Customer car care is always important. And sometimes kind of interesting. See you all next month.